listening to episode 118 of My Life Radio. I'm Matt Blackburn, and today I'm speaking with Morley Robbins once again. I consider Morley to be the world's top expert on minerals and mineral balance. In 2012, he founded the Magnesium Advocacy Group, and he educated about magnesium for many years, and then that led him to research iron and now copper. And one of his many sayings is there's 84 plus minerals, but there's only three that matter. And those three are magnesium, iron, and copper. He's an expert in hair tissue mineral analysis, and he's been promoting the Full Monty Iron Panel as a alternative to just your average Joe Schmo ferritin test, which tells you nothing about your iron status. And I've been hip to the iron problem for about a decade now, but it's only been in the last few years that I realized how important it really is. People debate back and forth all day long in the alternative health community about the root cause of chronic disease. And someone will say, it's all glyphosate's problem, and you detox glyphosate, and the body works better. Some people will say it's all parasites, or it's all heavy metals, or it's all EMFs, or it's all blue light. And I think when we get down to it, all of those things I just mentioned create severe mineral dysregulation. And when we get down to the mineral level of health, And we look out at the herd and seeing what everyone's dealing with. And they're going to Costco to buy their multivitamin and multimineral. And they're buying these really cheap products that are just as toxic as the environmental pollutants that we often hear about. The xenoestrogens, the artificial flavors, the food dyes, all of those things. And people are supplementing things that are throwing them even more out of balance, possibly more than those toxins that we're really careful to avoid. By the way, it's impossible. (laughs) That's not a way to live your life, to try to avoid everything. I always recommend living your life and just having things in place. And yeah, when you're home, you do your best. But when you're out and about, you live your life. And health is a lot more than food, it's about human connection, it's about relationships, it's about eye contact. And that's more important now than ever. And if you have bioavailable copper, you can handle a lot, as Morley's about to explain. Enjoy the show. All right, Morley Robbins, welcome back to the show. Well, it's great to be here. <laughs> we've, we've overcome obstacles of, of great magnitude, but we did it. And uh, it's fun to have this conversation. Looking forward to it as always. Yeah, it's easy to think that it's a conspiracy every time we try to chat because a tech thing <laughs> will always happen. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's those, it's those bad people out there. You know? <laughs> it's the iron people. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, when, when in doubt, always blame the iron people. Right? <laughs> so you uh, you emailed me something today. It was a clip of Ray Pete. Uh, the title was uh, Ray Pete on copper deficiency and iron and the relationship. And it's just a minute long. I'll post it in the show notes. But you were excited because you said it took you three years to figure out what he meant by sunlight is what keeps copper from becoming iron. Right? Exactly. It's it's a it's a quote that has been rattling around in my little cranium for several years. But the quote is, sunlight is what keeps copper from becoming iron. And it was, I first read it in his, um, he has a wonderful article <clears throat> on iron overload. And it's one of, the, one of his better articles, I think. And so I, I, I actually have three quotations that I think are relevant to this discussion. So we got the one about sunlight. 
Sunlight is what keeps copper from becoming iron. Then we have my all-time favorite researcher is Leslie Clavet. He's a real genius when it comes to copper. His, he's got an MD and a doctorate, um, really talented guy. And he can say more in four sentences than most people can say in four sentences, or four, four paragraphs, excuse me. So he's just, he's very efficient about what he says. And a number of years ago, I was talking with him and I was throwing out this idea that my theory was that B vitamins were copper dependent and their job was to regulate iron. And he was intrigued by that. He said, well, Morley, I can't speak for all of the B vitamins. He said, but what I can say with certainty is that folate B9 is copper dependent. And that, that statement of his has been ringing in the back of my head, along with Ray Pete's comment for a long time. And then probably the, the most lucid mind on the planet about mitochondria is a guy named Douglas C. Wallace. He's a geneticist at, at uh, CHOP, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. And in his signature article from 2005, he makes the following comment. The role of energy deficiency has been poorly explored by modern medicine. Loose translation, doctors don't know what energy is. They don't know how to make it. They don't know why it leaves the body. Why it, I think there are some doctors who are not even sure what mitochondria are, to be honest. You know, they, they, they'll say they do, but then you start to ask them, well, well, how many are in neurons? Or how many are in the, in the mature ovum of a woman? And they, they, they suddenly want to talk about the weather. And so we've got these three, three statements. And, and again, as we've discussed, I think, in the past, um, all conditions, all symptoms start with energy deficiency, an inability to make energy. And what was particularly important about what Dr. Pete was saying is that he identified four key variables that are involved in this copper iron dynamic. I'd never heard him talk about this before. <clears throat> he talked about if estrogen is elevated, if nitric oxide is building up, if you have low thyroid hormone levels, and if there's too much darkness. And suddenly it's like, boom, it all kind of clicked. And let me walk people through what he's really talking about. Because what he was saying is those four conditions could lead to not enough copper, too much iron in the mitochondria. And they all, they all relate to each other. It's absolutely amazing. So a lot of people have heard of the term estrogen dominance. People who are estrogen dominant have two problems. They're low in bioavailable copper. They don't have any ceruloplasm, and they got a lot of iron. They're really iron toxic. They're not estrogen dominant because iron and estrogen have been working with, with each other for just a few million years, maybe a few billion, to be honest. Um, actually, the, the, the first hormone on the planet was retinol, the light sensor. So this is... This is retinol, the light sensor. Then 700 million years later, along came this other hormone called hormone D, and it's a light filter, and people don't understand what that means, but it's blocking light, very important. And, and then along came this thing called, oh yeah, cortisol, and then along came estrogen and progesterone a long time later. Well, estrogen has a very dynamic relationship with iron, but it also affects copper, as you know. And so as soon as he says high estrogen, I'm thinking low ceruloplasm. We got a problem managing iron in this, in this body. Then he talks about nitric oxide. Nitric oxide buildup 
Well, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a very important enzyme that the comp that the mitochondria does is called nitrite reductase. Got to be able to turn this nitric oxide into nitrites and nitrates. And that's done at complex four. It's really important. Got to have copper to do that. And so if nitric oxide is building up, it means you don't got no copper, baby. And so then you got to, and as soon as copper starts to drop in the body, nitric oxide is going to rise. It's the backup plan. Low thyroid. Oh, there are a lot of people out there who really believe that, that this gland runs the body. And that's pure allopathic witchcraft. I think it's one of the funniest things on the planet. And, and so um, Jens Maytag in 2012 wrote a very important article talking about it's just the opposite. That long story short, T4 is a surrogate for serum copper, and T3 is a surrogate for ceruloplasm. Because it turns out that T3 is an oxygen sensor. So we've got retinol is a light sensor, T3 is an oxygen sensor. How are we burning on that oxygen, baby? And if it's not burning right, T3 is a hormone, right? And hormones are what? Signaling molecules. And they signal the liver, hey, we need more bioavailable copper. Could you make some more of that ceruloplasm thingy? And that's T3's job, is to tell the liver we need more bioavailable copper. It's the exact opposite of what we've been taught. And so low thyroid levels, well, we got low bioavailable copper. We know that because we have high estrogen and we got nitric oxide building up. Now we get this low thyroid thingy and then we get to too much darkness. Fascinating. Well, when people think light, they think sunlight, they immediately go to, I need more. It must be a vitamin D thing, right? That's what they're thinking, right? Has nothing to do with vitamin D. Absolutely has nothing to do with vitamin D, but we've been programmed like circus bears to believe that vitamin D is the only thing that's affected by sunlight. Well, we know, we know that the sensor, the light sensor, is very much affected by, and turns out sunlight activates the synthesis of vitamin D. We can all agree on that. Light activates the breakdown of retinol into the retinoids and the retinoic acids. It's a big deal. I think it's 100 times more important than vitamin D. We've had that conversation. And then here's something that just dropped into my lap a few, probably about two months ago. Guess what B vitamin is activated by sunlight, Matt? B9. B9, absolutely. Yeah, it's a real, it's a real big deal. So we've got Leslie Clavet telling us that it's copper dependent. And we find out that it's activated by sunlight. <clears throat> and what's B9 involved in? Oh, it's involved in regulating homocysteine and the methylation cycle. And it's a really big deal. And again, we've been trained like circus bears to believe, oh, your MTHFR is broken and you're, you're never going to be the same. When in fact, it's a copper dependent pathway relies on folate, relies on, on B12. The intrinsic factor, let's cut to the chase. What's the intrinsic factor? The only thing that makes sense is copper, but we can't say that because that would spoil the game, right? So we gotta keep, the, gotta keep the curtain drawn. Oh, there's an intrinsic factor in your body and we don't know what it is, but it's really important. And as soon as you start eating liver, you don't have any problems. It's the iron curtain. <laughs> It's the iron curtain. <laughs> and so, so we've got this B9 activated by sunlight. And what does homocysteine do to the mitochondria? What? Shuts them down. Wow. It shuts it down. Homocysteine, there's a, there's a very important chaperone to bring copper into the mitochondria. And it's called COX, COX-17. And homocysteine stops COX-17. 
But then there's more, you know, like for some internet advertisement. But there's more. And so homocysteine also binds up with that copper, and that becomes a problem. And then you, <clears throat> the mitochondria live on, my, on copper. They can't work without copper. <clears throat> uh, Paul Cobine at Auburn University, using um, yeast as the model, claims that there's 50,000 atoms of copper in the um, copper matrix pool. Uh, I've got seven articles now that confirm that it's actually ceruloplasmin that's the choo-choo train delivering copper to the mitochondria. And it's like, why don't we know this? Why, why is this such a secret? Why is, why is there such an iron curtain around all this? And, and so it's really important for people to realize that um, sunlight is, is a, an essential part of our diet. I think the, the people that follow you certainly know that. But we tend to take it for granted and we don't think about what's it really doing inside our body. And... And you don't you don't have to be stark naked at the equator for you know six hours. But that's just that's not true. You just need to stimulate the uh, mm -hmm. the retina. Um, but but the thing is, um, they don't tell us that, that folate is light sensitive. They don't tell us that folate is copper dependent. They don't tell us that folate runs the MTHFR function. So you know there's some really glaring defects. And so missing information equals missing truth. And so we're, we're channeled one way to think, oh, I need, I need these activated B vitamins, but not tell you why you need these activated B vitamins, because it didn't tell you about light and copper and all this other stuff. And so what, what Ray Pete is really letting us in on is how sensitive our body is to these various variables, the estrogen, the nitric oxide, uh, the, the T3 is not at the right level, and we've got too much darkness, but they are all related to the bioavailability of copper. And when copper is not bioavailable, iron can't be functional. And if iron is not functional, it's not being recycled properly. And, and what's the terminal destination for iron and oxygen in the human body? Where do they accumulate? The brain. The heart. In the mitochondria. In the oh, mitochondria. <laughs> That's the terminal destination for oxygen and iron. So the iron, do you realize they don't know where how the oxygen actually gets to the mitochondria? They really don't. I mean, this this article by um, Brian Glancy, it's a he's probably one of the reigning champs on mitochondria. And he has a really cool picture. These are pretty sophisticated audiovisuals, right? Huh? <laughs> but that's a that's a really cool picture of the mitochondria, and what's up here? That's a capillary, and and we're supposed to believe that. Oh, so the second most reactive element on the body, in the body, on the planet, oxygen after fluoride. So we got fluoride and oxygen. Third most reactive is ozone. You know, think about that. But so oxygen, second most reactive element, and it's being actively transported throughout the body and the blood, but then it gets to the gets to the mitochondria, and it just says, oh, yeah, okay, oxygen, just go go about your business. Just jump into the mitochondria. Go through the cell. Don't, don't stop it. Go. Don't touch anybody. Does that make any sense at all? I mean, it's like hey, there's, there's absolutely not one word written about it in the literature about how oxygen actually gets to the mitochondria. Not one wow. word at all. And trust me, I've looked for years. And, and so we, we can't make energy without oxygen. We can't make energy without activating oxygen. There's only one element on the planet that, that does that. And then if the, if, the, <clears throat> if, the, if the system, if the mitochondrial system is not working right, it's going to affect methylation, it's going to affect iron recycling. It's going to affect calcium recycling. It's going to affect uh, protein synthesis. It, there are about 12 different functions that all hinge on it. And what's really cool about this article by, by Brian Glancy, this is his 2019 
um, it's called visualizing mitochondrial form and function. So for you gearheads that really want to get into the mitochondria, you will love it. You're going to have to pay for it. Um, but what's really cool about the, what, about the article is he talks about how the mitochondria is at the center of all these different functions. And that's true. And what's, is, but what happens is, and let's play the Douglas Wallace card. If there's energy deficiency, the cell becomes very unstable and doesn't work right. And the oxidative stress is going to build. And that's the start of dis-ease. It then becomes disease. But there is no disease. There's only metabolic dysfunction. But, but the thing is, as soon as there isn't enough copper to activate oxygen and or enough copper to deactivate oxidants, iron's building up inside the mitochondria because it's supposed to be recycled. It's supposed to be put back into heme groups and iron sulfur clusters and move along, folks, move along. And if, if there isn't energy to do that, the iron builds up and it just robs the mitochondria of energy production. And so depending upon the, the model you're studying, there could be a 40% loss of energy, a 60% loss of energy, an 80% loss of energy, the highest I've seen is 96% loss of energy from too much iron in the mitochondria. And the, the interesting thing about Brian Glancy, he's got this picture in his 2019 article, but in his 2015 article, which I would, you can get that free, it shows um, a beautiful picture of what he calls the mitochondrial power grid. And we've been trained to think of the mitochondria as a powerhouse. It's not. It's a grid. It's, it's a, a web of organelles working in unison, trying to metabolize the oxygen to make the energy that's needed to support cellular function. And it's, 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 easy, to, it's easy to picture this. Oh, there's one mitochondria in the cell. So let's, let's take a liver cell that's got 2,000. Let's take a kidney cell that's got 4,000. Let's take a heart cell that has 10,000. Let's take a mature egg in a woman's body that has 600,000 eggs. 600,000 of these guys or gals. Are mitochondria male or female? Do we know? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it's like, it's like we, can't even, we can't even visualize... 10,000 of these organelles in a cell. And then my favorite question, after we get past how does oxygen get into the mitochondria, who's organizing the mitochondria? Have you ever thought about that? We got 40 quadrillion in our body. Who's, I guess copper. Who's, who's, orchest <laughs> who's orchestrating all this? Ceruloplasm. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice, right? And actually, actually, I think I know what it is. It's called... Um, AMPK, hmm. AMP for the adenosine monophosphate, and AMP phosphorylated kinase. It's a very powerful pathway, and it's and there's AMPK in our hypothalamus, and I think that's the that's the drumbeat for the body. And if AMPK gets gets tweaked, in, in it, and and what causes it to get tweaked? Oh. Oh, it's that iron thing. So you've got so you've got AMPK and you've got MTOR. Mammalian whatever. Target of rapamycin. <laughs> Thank you. Target of rapamycin. Thank you. Very good. And so did you know that iron activates mTOR? Wow. So iron activates mTOR. What does mTOR do to AMPK? Knocks it out of the picture. And so mTOR takes over. Do you think that might affect mitochondrial function? It told me to bring my seatbelt. <laughs> Zero to 100 in the first 20 minutes. I love it. <laughs> but, but the thing is, none of this is taught in, in practitioner school. Mm. Again, the role of energy deficiency has been poorly explored in modern medicine. And what we're talking about is the life force of our body. 
I mean, I get I get the biggest kick out of your videos of your goat. Your goat. I don't know what. What's his name? Bartholomew. <laughs> Bartholomew. Great, great name. Well, Bartholomew is, is entertaining as the day is long, but but that that guy has a lot of energy, doesn't he? Once. And so, yeah, and so it's like we should all have the energy of Bartholomew. I actually had He's to get a cattle. Friend. I had to get a cattle prodder because he. He would try to pin me on the wall, and when he gets big, that's that he could break my leg. I believe it. So I got yeah, some voltage, yeah. and now whenever he sees me holding that thing, he runs. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're having a down day, maybe you can. <laughs> no, it's, it, but it's it's just it's that's what that's what that's what we're supposed to have is this life force in us, this natural ability to turn oxygen into water so we can release energy. And it's it's been behind this iron curtain for decades. And people don't realize that it, it's it's really, it's elegant, but it's it's also pretty simple. When you really get into it, it's like, it's it's a really simple machine. And, and this is the distinction that I've come to realize. A lot of the, the mineral purists try to say, like um, Roger Roger. Joseph Prohaska, excuse me. I always want to say Roger. His, his first name is Joseph Prohaska. He's now retired from University of Minnesota in, in Duluth. And, and he's one of these purists that's like, well, copper only does 11 things. I'm like, seriously, dude? I mean, come on. And so the term that he focuses on is copper dependent. So that there are certain enzymes that have copper inside them. And so... Complex four, the mitochondria, is has three copper atoms running it, uh, and of course that's in the enzyme. But there's fifty thousand in this ma matrix pool that nobody talks about, or the fact that actually complex one is copper dependent. It's this, it's just like, ah. but <laughs> but the thing is, guys guys like Dr. Prohaska will tell you that there are only eleven enzymes that require copper, like. But that's actually not true. There's probably about 200. But, but he's talking about regulatory enzymes. But, but the term, I've, I've decided to refine the term. We have copper-driven and copper-dependent. And copper-driven is what he's talking about, where there's certain enzymes that actually physically have copper atoms inside it. Suruloplasm has up to eight, and lysyl oxidase might have as many as 10, and um, tyrosinase has two copper atoms, and things like that, that, that they just don't work unless there's copper inside them. They're copper driven. But what I've come to realize is that so many of the cellular functions that lead to, when, they, when these cellular functions don't work, like uh, calcium balancing or protein synthesis or iron recycling, when they're not working right, it's because the mitochondria are wobbling because they are copper dependent, not copper driven necessarily, but there needs to be energy that's being put out like that cattle prod. And if you're not putting out cattle prod energy from your mitochondria, there's a whole series of downstream impacts that we didn't realize were all secondary and tertiary and quaternary functions of are the mitochondria working? And that's the that's the distinction, and that's why it's really almost laughable that Dr. Wallace says it's poorly it's poorly understood in modern medicine is energy deficiency, because that's where the whole um, downstream impact unfolds, and it begins to have this compound effect as you go farther and farther into the pathways. Does that does that make sense, Matt? That's a great distinction. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I keep thinking back to, I don't go to them anymore, but all these health conferences, you know, like Bulletproof I would go to and stuff. And they would hand out yeah. like candy, these supplements at the door as you walk into the conference. And there were these little shots uh, with like PQQ and CoQ10 and there's, you know, D-ribose is trending and all these supplements. And over the years, you know, I used to think that was the jam. I used to think that's, oh, great. I'm charging up my mitochondria with these supplements. But it's more so the fundamental things like magnesium, right. which runs a lot of the complexes, like copper, right? And then just yeah, that's right. being aware of the iron problem. Yeah, being aware of it and doing taking action to try to keep it 
in circulation because mm -hmm. because we were never designed to be eating iron. It's and you know, we've talked about that on a couple of occasions, and it's it's really I think it's totally out of control. I don't think people realize. You know, I was um, responding to one of the um, students in my course, and her daughter is pregnant, and she said uh, she, her daughter went to see her obstetrician. And, and the obstetrician said she's low in hemoglobin and she needs an iron infusion. And I went, whoa, hold, hold on here. I said, what did, the, what did the doctor think low was? And she says, well, his, her, her hemoglobin went from 12 to 10. I said, that's not low. I said, in fact, that's high because she's six months pregnant. And... Uh, there's a uh, Philip Steers did a study in 1995. He's a famous British uh, obstetrician. You know, if he had done a study with 1,500 babies, that would have been a big deal. His study had 150,000 babies. And what he wanted to do was see what is the hemoglobin of the mother for the healthiest babies based on APGAR scores and just their overall demeanor. And typical um, hemoglobin for a non-pregnant woman would be somewhere between 12.5 and 13.5 or 125 and 135, depending on where you are in the world. And But when you're pregnant, in the, in the first half of the pregnancy, the hemoglobin is not going to change much. But in the second half of the pregnancy, it's going to go down. It's called hemodilution. It's a very natural event. The hemoglobin is being spread between one and a half people, the mom and the baby. And as the baby gets bigger, it's not going to be taking some of the hemoglobin. And what Dr. Steer found is that the healthiest babies were born to mothers whose hemoglobin was between 8.5 and 9.5. That's a big difference between 8.5 and 12.5, or even 13.5. And so what's happened is in the modern era, doctors and nurse midwives and all these practitioners have been trained that, oh, if it gets below 12, that's, that's a problem. And if it gets below 10, we have a crisis on our hand. And this study from 1995, which I know it's 25, 26 years old now, it's ancient, but it's 150,000 live births. It's a, it's a really big deal. And nobody knows about it. And so I've had three clients get iron infusions a week before they delivered. And all three women almost died. And all three babies almost died. And so this iron thing is really serious. And it really does gum up the works, as Matt really understands. But it's, it is just simple. Simple minerals and understanding how the body responds to stress. And that <clears throat> I think, as we've discussed, way too much attention given to the waiter carrying oxygen and no one knows about the chef activating it. And, and so now we have this added insight from, from Dr. Ray Pete about the importance of sunlight, but you only understand it if you understand folate. And you only understand it if you understand folate's role in regulating homocysteine. And, 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 this is do. You'll get a kick out of this. What happens if you have inflammation? So the mitoc so we've got <clears throat> we have hypoxia, inflammation, and cancer. Those are the three states of oxygen. We don't we don't seem to have enough, or we can't activate what we've got. Inflammation is oh, it's really building up. We got a, a lot of oxidative stress. Oh, we've got so much oxidative stress, we're going to call it cancer. So inflammation, it affects methylation. I didn't know that. Did you know that? I had no idea. And so when we have a chronic state of inflammation, which way do you think it's going to go? Is it going to go low or high with methylation? Low. I, that's what I would have thought. It goes high. It's called hypermethylation. And what does hypermethylation do? It silences genes. And, and one of the genes that it silences is a tumor suppressor gene. 
we now know the nuclear origin of cancer, Matt. And we know that there's a relationship between inflammation and cancer. And they're almost, they're, they're, they're kissing cousins. But now we know the exact mechanism. And, and if you don't have retinol in your diet, you're going to have a lot of inflammation in your mitochondria. And then you're going to have this hypermethylation. Because if the, if the mitochondria can't do their thing, it's going to affect the methylation pathways. I had no idea that these were interrelated. It's absolutely fascinating. So it's, it's really, the, this picture, this very simple picture from Dr. Glancy, when, when you study it, you'll see that it's connected to so many different pathways that we just sort of take for granted. We, we think of them as being separate condos in a, in a, in a, in a development, right? No, it's, we're talking about we're inside one condo. We've got all these different rooms, and they're all connected with each other. And, and if the furnace isn't working right, then it affects all the other mechanisms of the cell. It's, it's, I, I think it's fascinating, actually. It makes sense. Yeah, I, I like that you brought up the, the hemoglobin. Um, where you said 10 is not high because people send me like their Quest diagnostics and their lab tests and I always try to remind people like who set the numbers. I mean, especially for like hormone D that like, we've talked about a bunch of times in the gym where yeah. like the ideal used to be like 12, right? Nanograms per milliliter. And now it's like yeah. what, 30 plus 40 plus. <laughs> no, some, some practitioners don't get comfortable until it's 80. I mean, it's just, oh. it's out of control numbers. Yeah. And again, there's, there is this evolving uh, pattern in, in, uh, in medicine, of course, the, the bar is always going to be changing, mm -hmm. but, but they've lost sight of, does it make sense? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I don't think there's enough understanding about the fact that these metabolites and these minerals and vitamins, they're partnerships all over the body, and they need to be in, in tandem with each other, not in isolation of each other. And that's where I think there's been a lot of mistakes made as it relates to that. That makes sense. Yeah, I was part of like a debate panel and I made the point that they raised the bar and um, friend Georgie I've had on the show said, well, they raised the bar for a reason because they did these studies and they showed that, you know, because of whatever environmental pollutants or whatever it is, the changing world that we're in, they needed to raise the bar. But I just question, I mean, that's a significant jump, right? From oh, 10 to 12 to like 80. And... No, it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And, and again, it's, um, there's, there are a lot of variables that need to be considered when you start talking about A and D. I mean, these are, these are really primal uh, fat-soluble vitamins that, that play profound roles in the body. <clears throat> you start playing with one, it's going to affect the other, and it's just... People, people aren't aware of that. The average person doesn't know how interrelated these nutrients are and how interdependent they are. And so, I mean, I'm sure you've got clients that have drowned themselves in vitamin D, and um, it's it's really tragic when they do that. And yeah, and A um, is, is retinol. Um, is it the primary factor that that loads copper into ceruloplasmin, or is it the only one or the primary? It's 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 um. So when we turn retinol, the first thing that happens to retinol is it becomes retinaldehyde. And then retinaldehyde becomes retinoic acids. And there are at least four that I know of. You've got the all trans retinoic acid. There's 9 cis, 11 cis, and 13 cis. Cis is CIS. It's, it's a certain bend in the structure of the, of the um, molecule. And it's a 13 cis retinoic acid is the form of retinol that actually is involved in activating uh, an enzyme. It's called a copper pump. And there's, there's two of them. There's ATP7A and ATP7B. But it's ATP7B that, that loads copper into ceruloplasm so that it can perform its functions. And um, I came across an article just um, maybe four or five days ago that 
it's, it's rare to see this, but it was an, an author talking about 10 known functions for ceruloplasm. And usually what most authors will tell you is that, oh yeah, ceruloplasm, that, it, it regulates iron, you know, and that's all they'll talk about. Um, when in fact there's probably about 25 different functions, but this particular author at least acknowledged that there's 10 that, that are of pivotal importance um, that the people just aren't aware of. Wow. Like, well, managing, like, like, like managing nitric oxide. Wow. <laughs> More or less, is there a way to silence the, the messenger or can, can you close your messenger disc? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's driving you crazy, isn't it? Sorry. It's <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I'm just going to move it over here. Okay. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. No worries, thanks. <laughs> Can you hear it? Because it, it's still going. That's, that's a lot lower. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. All right. It, um, okay, I'll start now. All right. Um, yeah, you, when you were talking about light earlier and the, the repeat thing with the darkness, um, in my studies on light, um, I came across the photoreceptor called uh, rhodopsin in the eye, sure. and I guess that's that's pretty much built from vitamin A, right? From retinol. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, the rods and cones. So, uh, the, the, as you get into the into the world of ceruloplasm, it's it's pretty fascinating because um, there's four different forms of it in the body. Because um, you have you have what's called soluble ceruloplasm that's in the blood. Then you have what's called membrane. Bound. It's called GPI ceruloplasmin, and that's particularly important for the eyes, uh, but also for um, macrophages and the astrocytes of the brain and some other things. Then we have a form called hephaestin that hangs out in the intestines, and that's the form of, of the enzyme expression is called ferrooxidase. But that's the enzyme that allows iron that you've just ingested, allows it out of the enterocyte and into the bloodstream. Really big deal. Because mm -hmm. if you can't get it out of the enterocyte, it's going to fester and cause colitis, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel, SIBO, things like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you, the last form is called zyklopen, Z-Y-K-L-O-P-E-N. And that's a form that's found in the placenta of the mother's um, anatomy as she's pregnant. And it's managing, it's regulating the iron transfer between mother and child. So for those listeners who are thinking about getting pregnant or maybe they are pregnant, go ask your obstetrician about zyclopen status. And just brace yourself for some blank stares. But those are the four different forms of... of um, ceruloplasm, and it's often been said that the biggest production of ceruloplasm is coming out of the liver, and that's what they thought. And then the second biggest production would be in the brain, especially the astrocytes. There's a lot of iron up in the brain, as you, as you all probably know. But Dr. Chen at Northwestern University in 2004 rocked the world when he discovered that the retina of the eye produces eight times more ceruloplasm than the brain. And so there's a, tr what, what does that really mean? It means there's a tremendous amount of oxidative stress that's taking place in our eyes. A lot of light comes in, a lot of oxygen has to be dealt with, tremendous need for energy in the eye. These are actually nerve endings, they're not organs, they're, they're nerve endings. And so there needs to be a constant replenishment of ceruloplasm to tame the oxidative stress. And, and ceruloplasm, is, it's the master antioxidant protein in the body. And so all of the, all the eye conditions, all, every eye condition you've ever heard of, glaucoma, macular degeneration, whatever, it, it's all because of lack, it's a buildup of oxidative stress affecting different aspects of the eye function and the nerves. And, and it's just like, that's it. it it's, there is, 
Again, there is no eye disease. It's just a spectrum disorder of oxidative stress. Wow. Yeah, I, I keep thinking of lipofuscin because that that really messes up the eyes and it you know accumulates oh, yeah. in the RPE cells. There's quite a few studies on that, the retinal pigmented epithelial cells. And Absolutely. I just think those cells just have like super sensitive mitochondria, right? Like, and they really quite do. A bit. <laughs> yeah. And again, it, it, the, the, I think the, the primary bad guy is the iron. Mm. Again, there's, there's mm. got to be this constant recycling of iron, mm. you know, and, and so people don't know that they've not been, they, they've been trained to think that iron is low in their body. They need more. And we've, we've had that exchange and it's just, it's a constant battle to get people to realize that no, actually you've got too much. Is that too much? I had a I had a question. Um, I was meditating on this call the last few days, and I don't know if I've ever asked you this. And I'm willing to be the guinea pig. I don't know, but um, do you think someone with, with iron overload, without donating blood, that's relatively healthy? Like I don't have any chronic conditions that are serious. I mean, I probably have some stuff going on, but no, like oh, you know, symptoms I could see um, just by increasing copper and you know i drink my my coffee and do my beef liver and do all that stuff do you think over time that's enough because my friend josh rubin said that iron overload is just a copper deficiency and you probably agree right with that basic statement <laughs> oh yeah no it's again it's, and it isn't it isn't my opinion it's a compendium of hundreds and hundreds of research studies that's it's again it's those dots have not been collect, connected very well for the public, certainly not for the practitioners. And so if you don't understand how central a role that copper plays in managing iron, um, it's going to be lost on the average person. That people don't realize that um, there, <clears throat> there's a very pivotal point when, let's, let's look at it this way. Every second of every day, we have to make 2 million red blood cells every second. 2 million every second. So we've been talking for 40 minutes <laughs> times 60 times 2 million. It's a lot, of, a lot of red blood cells that we've just made. But <clears throat> what happens is there's what are called stem cells in our bone marrow, in the long bones, and they create what are called uh, erythroid precursor cells. Oh my God, what's this guy talking about now? But but those are the those are the precursors to the red blood cells. They're called erythrocytes. But there's a point where they need to multiply, but then there's a point where they need to mature and leave the world of being a, a precursor and become a full-fledged red blood cell. And that takes about 48 hours for that to happen. And there's one principal requirement. Got to make energy. If you can't make energy, you can't make the transition from being a precursor to being the full-fledged red blood cell. And so it's called that's called differentiation. And if it can't do that, what happens is the erythroid cells just keep proliferating because they don't have enough energy to, to flip over. They just keep making. And so then a blood test is done, and people look low in hemoglobin it's because they're a bunch of precursor cells over here, but they couldn't become red blood cells to be to get full fledged hemoglobin inside them, mm. and that's where the that's where the breakdown is. Is it's about energy, and so people who have quote anemia, yeah, it's it's a lack of copper because you can't make energy without copper, and so so it's it's just on so many levels that's one of the most important functions of the mitochondria is to provide the energy to allow that critical recycling process in the in the red blood cells to take place. And that's just one. There, the, I don't know whether we've talked about this, but the um, we have two dominant ways of making money in, in the country. We have farms and we have factories. And they have very different philosophies. Philosophy of, of the farm, it's recycle. We're going to recycle sunshine. We're going to recycle seed. We're going to recycle uh, soil. We're going to recycle manure. There's another word begins with S, but we won't say that. But it's all about recycling. It's very important on a farm to, to be able to recycle. 
But that's not the philosophy of a factory. The factory is all about, let's replace it. You need a new microphone. You need a new headset. You need a new, you need a new goat. That's what you need. And, or you need a new car or a new TV or whatever. Well, replacing and recycling, they're very different. And so it turns out that there's a whole series of recycling centers in our body. In fact, humans are actually, we're, we're a recycling center, basically. We're constantly recycling, rebuilding, you know, re-metabolizing our body. And it's all at the direction of one mineral called copper. And here's the catch. Copper is a factory worker that needs to be replaced every day. So we've got this very sophisticated series of recycling systems that depend on one mineral that needs to be replaced every day. And we lose 95% of our copper every day. And we recycle 99% of our iron every day. We don't need to be eating it. That's the biggest mistake on the planet. And, and so that's where there's this fascinating difference between copper and iron. And you can't recycle iron if you don't have copper. And so anyone who has any kind of iron issue has a copper issue. Does that make sense? Awesome. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, and I definitely recommend people go by, uh, go back and listen to, I think, our previous now seven conversations or something. But they're all, yeah, they all cover different aspects of this. And it's a lot of fun. So. <laughs> and hopefully this, these, they're, they're building on each other. At least that's, <laughs> that's the illusion in our mind, Matt. <laughs> no, they, yeah. they definitely are. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, we can jump into some of the questions that are related yeah. to this, this topic. Um, yeah. I think before we started recording, I asked you, we had some questions about, I guess we could just talk about these mitochondrial supplements because I fell for that for quite a few years. And, um, yeah. you know, does PQQ, I think it stands for pyroloquinone, quinolone, quinone, it's a quinone, and CoQ10, coenzyme Q10. I used to take ubiquinol, uh, yeah. NAD precursors, you know, NR, NMN. What are your thoughts on those in general? Like, Well, um, <laughs> you know, they're... They certainly can play a role. P PQQ, there's an enzyme, or PQQ, I think, is a, actually is an enzyme, if I'm, if I'm remembering it. And believe it or not, it's copper dependent. <laughs> a lot of people don't. So I think wow. the, the, the catch for people to learn is that if they're selling you a supplement that's deficient in your body, you can better believe it's either magnesium dependent or copper dependent. Mm -hmm. And so... <clears throat> Everything about the mitochondria is all about copper. I mean, magnesium's there. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that it's not, but it's just. It's really laughable that we don't know how important copper is to the mitochondria, and so PQQ. Uh, I believe what it's designed to do is increase the number of mitochondria. Well, if you got mitochondria but you don't have copper, what have you done? <laughs> you know, right. have you really helped yourself? Um, CoQ10, I think it's a, this is a really um, debatable point, and actually we're even thinking about adding it possibly to the, to the RCP. Hmm. Um, people, if you're taking statins, you're, you're killing your CoQ10. Hmm. That, that's a fact. And CoQ10 is, it's a shuttle that's moving electrons in the mitochondria at a very critical stage of the, of the, the process. But that's not all that CoQ10 does. CoQ10 is, is involved in the lysosomes. There are what are called high-energy peroxides that break down um, the proteins and different metabolites that need to be broken down. And I just learned recently that that's one place where copper stored is in the lysosome. That's a storage center. So lysosome is a stomach for the cell. And if it doesn't have copper, it's not going to work right. And there's a, a whole class of conditions called 
lysosomal storage disorders. Well, if you can't make the high energy peroxides because you don't have enough copper, then you're not going to be able to do the recycling that we were talking about just a few minutes ago. And you're going to, you're going to end up with a bunch of that lipofusin thing that makes Matt really nervous because it, because one of the things that gets recycled in the lysosomes are going to be organelles that have iron in them, especially the mitochondria. And there's a tremendous amount of iron in the mitochondria, but it needs to be recycled properly and, and rebuilt into different proteins. And if, if you don't have those high energy peroxides, you're going to have a problem. So the, the CoQ10, uh, can be very important to support and offset the, the natural process of, of oxidative stress. Um, and what was the third one you mentioned? Oh, the NAD. Um, mm -hmm. I, I haven't really done enough research on that. I, I'm like, really? Seriously? Do we? Um, because it, the thing is, um, we've, got to, we've got to produce what are called reducing equivalents. Well, that's a chemical term. Reducing equivalence is things are going to give off hydrogen. That's for hydrogen. You, to, to make energy, you've got to be able to, you, know, you don't just activate oxygen. You've got to activate hydrogen so that the two come together to make water. And so one O2 molecule needs four hydrogens and make two molecules of water. And it's a big deal. And... They both need to be activated, and they, they need to come together in a very special way in complex four. And the chef running that show is, is copper, uh, it's called cytochrome C oxidase. And so the, the hydrogen is very important for that process. And the NAD becomes NADH. That then supplies the hydrogen. FAD becomes FADH2, and that also supplies hydrogen. But I think the bulk of it is coming from the nicotinamide side. And it just, I'm not clear about the need for that as much as I am. Probably of the three, the CoQ10 is probably the one that's, but, but again, you, CoQ10 is like cars. You get what you pay for. <laughs> and, and, and what you should be, Buying is Mercedes and not Yugos. Please don't go to Walmart to buy your CoQ10. Not a good idea. You go to Walmart to buy your car oil, but go to the best place you can to buy your supplements. Yeah, I'm sorry. good point. And I've heard it's in a uh, heart. Like I used to, uh, oh, I still yeah. have like liver, heart, you know, ground bison mix. It's like two percent yeah. liver, two percent heart. And uh, that thing boosts me like nothing else. I, I right. love that. So. <laughs> well, again, th think about what the heart's doing. It, it never gets a break, right? <laughs> Not, nonstop beating heart. Never gets downtime. And uh, here's a, I mean, we've talked about this, but um, the heart beats 72 times a minute. And it takes a billion ATP for one heartbeat. 72 times a minute times 60 minutes times 24 hours. And it just keeps going. So that's a lot of ATP. We, we make, supposedly we make our body weight in ATP every day. And that's a lot. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an enormous amount. Again, we're back to recycling. I think, I think ATP can be recycled like 16 times, if I remember correctly. Hmm. There's a point where it, it wears out. I don't know why. I'm not quite sure why. But but there is this natural process of recycling uh, the ADP to get back to ATP. And that's a really critical function for the body to, to engage in. Yeah, it's my understanding that like, creatine is involved in that. Like, I used to supplement that for the mitochondrial benefits because <laughs> it recycles ADP to ATP. Right. Yeah. Um, no, it, it, again... But, but there's but there's enzymes involved, right, right, right? And those enzymes require copper. I can guarantee you that. Makes sense. This is a good one. Um, copper one and two. What's the difference? I guess there's something <laughs> going around because there's like the raw primal thing growing in popularity right. now, and people right. are saying cooked liver is bad because the copper 
is oxidized to its copper two state. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah. I, it, um, it, uh, copper exists in two states, copper one and copper two. Um, Ceruloplasma has both states. Most people don't know that. There's wow. there's four copper ones and four copper twos. Although all the modern literature says there's only six. So ask yourself, where do those two coppers go? Because for, for uh, 25 years, there were eight. And then for 25 years, there were seven. And now there's only six. That should make you very nervous. Where did those two coppers go? Wow. Um, and... And the, and the copper researchers can't tell me. Like, seriously? Come on, guys. You know? But um, again, think about our ancestors eating organ meats for millennia, and they cooked them, mm -hmm. and they did just fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, there's, there is a lot of buzz about one and two, and oh, the copper twos in the p copper pipes, and that's going to, you're going to get Alzheimer's from that. And it's just like, it's just stop, you know. And let's let's make sure we're eating food that has copper in it. And the and the, the most important aspect of it is, ideally, copper should be in the soil, so it can get in the microbes. Actually, you've heard of. Or maybe you have it. Do you know what nitrogen fixation is? A little bit. Making the sure elementary that, level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, making sure that you can work with nitrogen. It's really important for plants. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the enzyme to fix nitrogen is copper dependent. So 95% of the nitrogen fixation is soil dependent. And then there's, or actually maybe it's 90%, and then 10% can be done up in the air. Well, here's the, this is kind of weird. The one in the air uses iron, the one in the soil uses copper. Oh, so could that be why they're pouring down tons and tons of NPK? Is to bypass the copper. And what does NPK do? It blocks the absorption of copper by the plants. And then we, so then we have NPK, and we have all these copper sulfate sprays, and then we have glyphosate. And it's a miracle that we can get copper uh, in any of the food that we have. But mm. the copper is best when it is put into the root system of the plant so that the plant knows what to do with copper. The plant knows what to do with a lot of the minerals. But um, a lot of that function has been messed with with modern agriculture. Um, I don't get too jazzed about the one and the two because I don't think, pe I don't think people realize that when they take a supplement – that they think is one, what, as soon as it goes into the stomach, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to get oxidized. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's not going to be the way they, they think it is. So it's a, it is a point of debate and people love to, to argue it, but there's, there's no mention of this in the literature. They don't really worry about it. I've asked uh, Dr. Clavet on several occasions, what's the form of, of um, copper that you like to work with? And he, he uses copper gluconate. That's plus two. And he says he gets great results with it, with humans. And so, and, and I would say that, that Dr. Covey knows more about copper than a, a million physicians on the planet combined. So, again, it's, I, I forgive me if I sound flippant. I just, I don't get lost in that debate because I, I don't think people understand what bioavailable copper really is. And I think it's best in food form, which you really promote um, heavily, which I think is important. And we, at some level, we have to trust the farmers that they're doing their job. Where, where does copper need to be? It needs to be in the soil so that it can get into the grass. How does it get into the grass? It's called vitamin C. And it turns out that there's 18 times more retinol in grass than there is in carrots. And there's 14 times more vitamin C <clears throat> in grass than there is in oranges. Wow. And so maybe there's something to this grass-fed thing. And actually, uh, my wife and I, Dr. Liz and I, were reading um, William Campbell Douglas's book on milk, the, the Milk of Human Kindness is Not Pasteurized. Wonderful book, just chock full of, of data. 
and information. And he, he talks about how important grass is. And he said, if you get hungry, go outside and eat some grass. Probably <laughs> one of the best things you can do for your body. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah, I've been yeah. studying uh, goat physiology again. I have this book. I can't remember the name yeah. of it, but it was like a $100 book on Amazon, kind of out of print. Yeah. And um, the vitamin E and copper thing is fascinating with goats because those are two key nutrients for them. Um, sure. We're both involved with managing iron and stuff. And uh, I recently and – managing, And managing oxidation. Right. Oxidative stress. Yeah. Good point. And I picked up a second doe a few days ago and uh, the goat, the goat woman, she breeds sand and goats and she talks my ear off, but it's all great stuff. It's just, she, she's so knowledgeable about animals and goats specifically. And I was like, yeah, thinking of eventually getting some sheep. And she made an interesting point. She said, don't put them together because you, the sheep can die from too much copper. That's right. Whereas goats, they require so much more. And I was like, wow, I wonder, wonder yeah. why that is. Yeah. <laughs> it, again, it, it's a genetic thing, obviously, yeah. but but that's very true. The, the, the sheep uh, are very, very sensitive to copper status. Mm -hmm. And and go, that, I mean, for people who are looking for goat or if you're looking for copper, goat meat and goat, goat meat is laced with a lot of fat. Mm -hmm. Well, copper is a fat soluble mineral. Can't can't absorb it without fat. But the flip side is you can't break down fat without copper. Mm -hmm. And so the fat all the fat um, breaking down enzymes are copper dependent. And so it's just, mm -hmm. there's this interdependence between fat and copper that, mm -hmm. that a lot a lot of people don't know about. That's awesome. Yeah, I just started giving the, the does free, free minerals to graze on. And um, it's just amazing how they can transmute with their, with their rumen, you know, any, any yeah. mineral into a usable form. Just they're amazing animals. <laughs> they really are. Yeah, and it's, it's too bad us humans don't have that capacity. Right. <laughs> so this is a funny story. I was in the sauna, I think, last week listening to you speak with uh, Justin, my friend on Extreme Health Radio. And oh, yeah. uh, I think you, you're talking about sweating out iron in the sauna. And yeah. I guess you could do that to some degree. Mm -hmm. I was not aware of that. And someone asked, I mentioned it on social media and someone wanted you to explain like, how it works. Do we know, or is it just a metal thing? <laughs> you know, all the metals will kind of slowly, I mean, it's not, you, you said it's not as good as blood donation, right? But no, no, yeah. it's, it's, no it's a fair question. That's a really fair question. I've, mm -hmm. I first became aware of it with a client. Uh, she was in her late twenties. Uh, her husband was stationed in Germany and she was deemed anemic by her uh, German physician. And so he, he gave her two iron infusions, which, didn't do a lot for her. But she started to have night sweats. Again, she's 20, like 28 years old, and she starts to sweat at night, which is not, that's not normal. You're not supposed to do that. That's what you, like when you're in your 50s, you might have menopause that might have that dynamic. So she went to change her white sheets, and then she pulled back the white sheet. There was supposed to be a white mattress pad, and it was red. And it was the iron that was coming out of her system because of the of the um, night sweats. So that's when I first began to like, whoa, this is. So when we sweat, we're going to lose a lot of minerals: you know, magnesium, potassium, sodium, of course. Um, but we don't think about it again. The um, the fluid that is in, uh, involved in the sweating process, it's going to have all of the minerals. I, I guess in some respects, it's like the extracellular fluid. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's full of, of minerals. The, the, like the plasma, sometimes it's called plasma, sometimes it's called serum. But that's the, that's the seawater that red blood cells swim in. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's, it's, supposed to be, it's supposed to have the mineral composition of seawater, which is pretty cool, actually. But, um, but not as much sodium, obviously. But the thing is, there's a lot of minerals in our fluid, and I don't know what the actual concentration of iron that would come out, but there is iron loss, just as there is other mineral loss, and it's just a natural process of, I, I'm not even sure where that fluid is coming. It must be coming from a lymph system, I would guess, mm -hmm. and that, that, that's a whole other highway, 
So we've got the blood highway and we've got the lymph highway. They've got the same amount of fluid in them, which is amazing. And all we've been taught about is the blood highway. We don't know how important lymphatics is. And, and, and that, that that's, that's basically the sewer system in the body. And so the, the sweating is, is a great way to get rid of some of the other particulates. But uh, it's usually through our urine and our, our feces that we get rid of stuff. But sweating is another way, obviously, to do that. I just don't know what the amount is. Mm -hmm. but, but far and away, the most effective way to, to keep the iron homeostasis in, in proper regulation is to do blood donations. And that, that goes back hundreds of years that, they, that people have been doing that to maintain that. That's great. Yeah, I was. I spent a, a few hours a couple months ago trying to find a device at home for a phlebotomy. <laughs> I, found, I found one called Venus Pro, but I guess it never went to market. It's just like, a, but you just basically a machine, like an AI kind of controlled computer thing wow. that will just take some blood. That's my dream. Just have a home unit someday. <laughs> <Be No amazing. laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I have the courage to puncture myself. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> I mean, I've got I've got students and clients that have done it for themselves. I've got one, a couple of people have actually used leeches. I couldn't do that. I'm, I'm like, you know, no, can't go there. I'm like Humphrey Bogart in the African Queen. I'm like, oh my god, I got leeches. So, but but great. Thankfully, there are some really talented uh, phlebotomists out there, so I, I am able to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. This is a good one. Um... Back to the topic, does mitochondrial health have any effect on anxiety and depression? In the past, he said iron activates the fear center, right? So, well, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, so, so people who, people who live in the past get depressed and people who live in the future get anxious. They're different, they're different centers of the brain and Absolutely, energy is involved in, in both energy dysregulation, um, and the again the word depression isn't referring to an emotional state; it's referring to an energetic state. It's there's a lowering of energy production, which is causing the the rest of the body to follow, and it involves dopamine metabolism. And if dopamine is not being regulated properly, uh, you, you, you will have a depressed... <clears throat> dopamine is going to affect energy production. And I've forgotten the exact mechanism. I think it has to do with... It's either complex 2 or complex 3, but dopamine really messes up one of the mitochondrial complexes, and it's going to disrupt the, the production of energy. The anxiety side, I don't know as well. I, I don't know whether it would be interesting if it was serotonin, given that Dopamine and serotonin are so interrelated, but um, the I know that people who are anxious are iron toxic, and it's the 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 mechanism to or the the amino acid that's highest in our body is glutamate, and we need to turn glutamate into GABA, which is calming, and the enzyme to do that. Is called glutamic acid decarboxylase, and it requires magnesium, B1, B2, B3, and B6 to run that enzyme. And that enzyme is what turns glutamate into GABA. And who's managing glutamate in the neurons? Copper. And wherever the nerves are are coming together, copper needs to be here to regulate glutamate. So you got a copper side, you got a magnesium and B vitamin side. Who who's running the B vitamins? Maybe copper. Ooh. And so glutamic acid decarboxylase got turned into GAD because we've got to shorten everything to initials. And then the psychiatrists were very clever said, well let's call GAD, general anxiety disorder, and not call it glutamic acid decarboxylase because nobody knows what that is, but people are being treated for general anxiety disorder with benzodiazepines, which are probably the most, if not the most toxic, one of the most toxic chemicals on the planet. 
And what do they do? They destroy copper metabolism in the brain. So the people who've been exposed to benzos have a very difficult time getting back to homeostasis. It can be done, but it might take a couple of years. And the taper is incredibly gradual and slow. So if you, if you do are prone to anxiety, focus on your mitochondria, not medicine. That's, that's really what you want to do. And you want to really be mindful of the iron side of it and what messes up the GAD enzyme, too much iron. It's going to affect, it's going to affect magnesium status and it's going to affect the B vitamins. Hmm. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. It's funny in light of our conversation, um, I don't know if you've seen my posts but I, uh, I got a sensory deprivation float tank within the last few months. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. <laughs> it's like 1,200 pounds of mag mostly magnesium sulfate, but maybe 200 yeah. pounds of magnesium chloride. It's an and, amazing uh, experience. Yeah, I think I've, I've passed like 40 or 50 hours in that thing. It's just been profound for, my, for lowering my baseline stress. And I always wonder how much of it is building my magnesium with that transdermal mm -hmm. just hundreds and hundreds of pounds and how much of it is, is the, the sensory part, you know, deprivation. So, well, there's a good way to find out do it, do a hair test and do a blood test. Yeah. And we, and we could talk about it on air. It could be a fun uh, case study. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. The, the float tank guy that sold me it, he was saying that I guess Dr. Mercola said with oral magnesium, he couldn't raise his RBC levels, but when okay. he started doing the tank, you know, with the hundreds and hundreds of pounds of magnesium salts, it raised it. So I, that made me wonder, like, was it, is he taking care of his iron or is his iron so high that his burn rate is just insane? <laughs> no, I, that, that, it took me years to figure out the people who had low mag RBC had high iron. Mm. And, and I think it's more of a kidney issue when you, when you can't get the, magnesium RBC up. I think it's a kidney issue. Again, I would blame the iron. But that's mm -hmm. fascinating that, that the transdermal, I have to think about why that would be so much more effective, probably because a lot of people have trouble just digesting anything, much less mm -hmm. magnesium supplements. Yeah. Were you saying kidney issue with the oral magnesium or? Excuse or, me? Were you, well, what, no, I think that's a, that's a fair question. Mm -hmm. um, I think people who have... Um, kidney issues. It doesn't have to be full-blown CKD, mm -hmm. but I think, again, think about it. What, what's the emotion attached to kidneys? It's fear. It's fear. And if you're in a subtle state of fear, it's going to affect the function of the kidneys, which is going to affect the magnesium uptake that the kidneys are supposed to be engaged in. Again, fear, we spell it differently, F-E hyphen A-R. <laughs> When there's fear, there's going to be more iron. And then there's going to be less magnesium. Um, but, no, I, I mean, I've not read articles about this. This is just me thinking intuitively, does this, does this make sense? And I, th I think they're really, as I've, I've, I've combed the literature, it seems like there's a connection between magnesium status and kidney function. So mm. That would be where I would start. That's awesome. Um, this is a funny one. If zinc opposes iron, why isn't it a good supplement? Does it oppose iron? <laughs> well, it, it does. <clears throat> no, that's actually an excellent question. Um, we can't live without zinc. Yeah. But I, I think we live in a world where there, there's been an overwhelming amount of attention given to zinc. And <clears throat> um, the, the the tricky part to zinc is that it'll get tested in a blood test, and it very often will look low. And not a lot of practitioners will know that or know why is it low. Well, when when the, the body is low in copper, iron's going to build in the liver. That's a fact. We've known this since 1928. Absolutely established fact. And when iron builds in the liver, it's going to cause magnesium loss in the liver. Very, very important. When iron's high in the liver, magnesium's going to leave. And so 
there are a whole bunch of enzymes. There's 500 enzymes that the liver is engaged in, and there's a big chunk of them that require magnesium. But not all of them require magnesium. Many of them just require a plus two valence. And zinc is a convenient metal to use. And so the liver takes zinc out of the bloodstream, so the blood looks low in zinc, when in fact the real problem is this low copper, low magnesium, and high iron, and nobody knows about that. And so then they give the person a zinc supplement, and they don't know that zinc activates metallothionine, which is a very powerful protein made in the liver. And what does it do? It binds up copper a thousand times stronger than it binds up zinc. So we don't know what a thousand times is. Matt, you're probably twice as strong as I am. So I can relate to twice as strong, or maybe three times as strong. A thousand times as strong? We can't even we can't even we can't even process that in our brain. So basically, zinc is taking copper offline, and then it's not available to activate oxygen and activate hydrogen to make water to make energy. So it's again, there's 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 a whole series of interconnected uh, levers. And what practitioners are taught is what's high and what's low, not knowing about the interrelationships between these metabolites and minerals and, and vitamins. And that's, that's the most important part is that they do communicate with each other. And they do have interrelationships with each other. And that, that just because something is low, the question that's not being asked enough is, why is it low? Why is this vitamin D low? Why is this zinc low? Why does magnesium keep showing up low in my hair test or my blood test? Or that's the question that needs to be answered. And and if iron is low in the blood, what? Why is it low in the blood? That's a good question. But but that means if it's low in the blood, it means it's high in the tissue. Why is it high in the tissue? Because it's not being recycled. Why? Because the mitochondria aren't working right. They're not making energy to recycle iron, and so then it can't get back into the bloodstream. And the way I like to think of it, is this accurate that copper opens the front and the back door for the cell for iron to come in and out? Is that correct? Or because there's ferroportin um, we've talked about in the past, or is yeah, there a better so way to say it? <laughs> well, there are there there are five doorways for iron to get into the cell. Hmm. Only one of them involves copper. The, the, the most natural involves copper. It's called uh, DMT1, it, dimetyl transporter 1. It's got another name, and I'm, not, I'm blanking on it right now. But there's four other doorways in, which is kind of scary. <laughs> it's like, ah. So there's, there's five doors for iron, and there's only one door out, and that's the ferroportin doorway. And again, some of your listeners know about uh, hepcidin, and they think, oh, hepcidin controls that. It's like, no, 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 no. A, a 25 amino acid is is regulating, uh, is going to outregulate 1,066 amino acids? I don't think so. So, ceruloplasm is going to dictate what the function of the ferroportin is going to be. And um, that's not what the literature is going to tell you. They're going to have all bells and whistles around hepcidin and then forget to tell you that vitamin D blocks hepcidin, that the fancy forms of B1, the super duper forms of B1 block hepcidin. You don't, you don't, want, you don't want hepcidin blocked. You, you want it to be a free agent doing its job, but in regulation with ceruloplasm. And those are just two of the uh, hepcidin inhibitors that I know about. There may be there are others, but we have to be really careful about the uh, forms of the supplements that we're taking you know, especially the ones that we've talked about with Jim Stevenson Jr. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, Ray's, Ray woke me up to the, because I used to do the nice and flushes, you know, the L. Ron Hubbard, trampoline, yeah. sauna, flush. And uh, I, I question the safety of that now, either flushing or non-flushing of that form of B3. So I just take niacinamide now. And it seems yeah. to, you know, nicotinamide in the literature, um, Seems to have a totally different effect that's safer. <laughs> Absolutely. I totally agree with you there. Mm. Again, I think people, uh, one, of the, one of the most powerful uh, conversations I have was in 
February of 2019. Um, it was with a, a guy named Michael Greenberg. He's a big marketing guy in, in uh, alternative uh, healing circles. And he, he said, you know, I'm always asked, hey, Michael, what's what's new? What's new? And, and he said, you know, I've, I've learned to ask what's enduring. And I, I think we're too often we're inclined to jump to what's new, like, oh, copper one and copper two, that's a, that's trending, as you say. But what's the, what's the enduring quality of copper and, and magnesium or what, whatever these organ meats are? What, I think people need to be looking back more to see what, what has sustained society and civilization for thousands of years, not what's popular as of, uh, you know, 550 in Eastern Coast, coast time. It's just we we're, we're so conditioned to think that whatever's coming out of the out of the scientific labs, you know, right now, that's really safe. No, it's not. But I would. Right. I, we really have to question the validity of a lot of the contemporary conclusions that are being drawn, just because they're done, they're being done without a real understanding about how iron is functioning in the body, how copper is regulating iron, how energy is actually being made, how oxygen is being regulated in the body. It's like th these really basic um, components that are essential for our well-being are not, I don't think they're widely understood. And and that that's a little unsettling, that people don't have a better working knowledge of it, especially the people that we go to for our health advice. Mm, yeah, that's well said. I, I used to be raw vegan. I don't know if I told you that for years. I was like pretty much 100% raw foodist because I was all about the enzymes and sure. under 118 mm. degrees. And I was doing my soaked and sprouted and dehydrated stuff. And uh, there's a resurgence to that now, but on the mm. animal side of the equation. And it's interesting because oxidation, I mean, that can happen through heat, light, or oxygen. Absolutely. And people, you know, think about, oh, oxidized iron or oxidized copper and they freak out. But I like your point earlier that we're we're hot, right? We're 98.6. It's going to oxidize anyway when we eat it, whether it's raw or cooked. <laughs> no, that's just, it. that's just it. And, you know, one of the one of the big um, breakthroughs in the last couple of couple of weeks is <clears throat> one of the one of the jobs of the lysosomes is to keep the pH of the cell stable and they does it they do it through an enzyme called b type atpase matt put on your thinking cap who do you think runs v type atpase Riloplasmin. well copper oh it's copper, copper. okay and so the, the whole mechanism of keeping the ph of the cell in balance comes back to our friend copper and it's like, it's like seriously. So again, it's 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 a little mind-boggling to think about that. There's so many different functions. As one of my students said, Morley, why don't you just tell us the five or six enzymes that copper doesn't do, and we'll memorize those because it seems like everything else require, requires energy or copper or magnesium, and that's pretty much what it comes down to. And again, you can't make energy without magnesium and copper. And if you want to really mess it up, take too much iron. That's it. No, it's it's like, and people are like, yeah, but it's got to be more complicated than that. No, it doesn't. And that's what that's what they they want us thinking it's more complicated. This is really simple. It's incredibly simple. Mm -hmm. And and what have they done? They've they they've and there is a they, but they've gone after the smallest micronutrient that has the biggest impact in the body, and that's copper. There's no other micronutrient that has the reach and the impact. And all you got to do is take mic, mic, micrograms out of the body and it doesn't work right. It's just, it's amazing. And then, and then flood is full of iron. Are you kidding? It's like, it's insane. So. Yeah. And glyphosate and zinc supplements and ascorbic acid. And all <laughs> no, it's just, it, people, people just don't stop and think about, again, what what I think happened, that there's no evidence of this, but this is my theory. There was this big encyclopedia, about this thick, big, big, thick book on copper metabolism, and they blew it apart about 100 years ago into, into a thousand pieces. And nobody has the full story. 
There, there is no, as, as much as I admire uh, and value the opinion of like Jamie Collins and Leslie Clave and um, Lauren Pickard, and there's a whole bunch of people, and you know even Joseph Prohaska and Lut, uh, Svetlana Lutsenko, and these are some of the big, really big names of copper metabolism. They all combined, they don't have the. You know, it's just it's it's really tragic that there isn't this uniformity of thought about how the body depends on copper. It's it's like they're trying to reform it, reformulate it, and and re uh, codify it, I guess, but. It, they're not even close. And it's just like, goodness gracious, there's a lot riding on this. <laughs> That's what I really appreciate about, appreciate about you and why I love having you on the show regularly because it takes a certain type of person. I definitely can't do it to be able to sift through the literature and dig in beyond just the abstract, which tend to, yeah. people tend to do. They'll just go off the abstract and say, okay, this and make conclusions. But to connect the dots like you do, um, I really appreciate that and uh well it's, it's yeah. a late life uh, epiphany this is this was not this was not morally in college i can tell you that this is a, like why am i in this class no this is I, now it's just fascinating to me i i wish i could go back to college i think i would really love it now but it's like um this is and it and it really as some of the listeners might know this all evolved after i wanted to know why is everybody so sick couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. But well, now, well, now we know why. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's absolutely, um, it's hard to fathom that all of these different conditions that we know about all converge on this copper, iron, oxygen, not playing well. And um, it's just, it, it defies logic. It's just like, it's just, how is this possible? So. Yeah. And for, for those that haven't listened to the previous episodes, um, you recommend because everyone's going to, I mean, the question, it's like we've said copper a million times, but like, where do I get it? And you tend to recommend like ruminant animal liver, whole food C and bee pollen. Is that mm -hmm. correct? It's like yeah. the top sources. Yeah. Yep. And and people, you know, they just need to go to the, um, find the root cause protocol, um, rcp123.org. Uh, I'm going to start another way. So root cause protocol is RCP, but but, but I think what it also stands for is retinol and copper programming, because I think that's really what runs the body is retinol and copper. And, um, and so that's why they've got us pumped full of vitamin D and iron, right? Because it's going to mess up the programming. And, um, but there's a, a whole series of, of nutrients that we have people take, but we also have people stop taking these. And we've talked about several of them. But um, but the bee pollen, great source of, of copper. Can't can't pollinate a flower without copper. So it's it's there along with the B vitamins. That's when I really first started thinking that the B vitamins had copper because bee pollen. It's it's right there. Um, but then the vitamin C again. Think about the grass. Don't forget the grass, <clears throat> and and be mindful of the fact that like. Um, Cabbage, a cup of cabbage has 60 milligrams of vitamin C. A cup of sauerkraut has 600 milligrams of vitamin C. Well, how'd that happen? The yeast in the air that's full of what? Copper got into the cabbage wow. and turned it into sauerkraut. And it, that's, that's the beauty of biology is the transformations that can take place. And and ruminant animals eating grass turn that grass into all sorts of nutrients that are that are copper dependent. But the, but the organ meats are going to be again. The organ meats are all very mitochondria rich. Well, of course, there's going to be a concentration of copper there. It, they, they go hand in glove. And then you know there are other elements like the retinol is very important. And I'm on um, that. What I'm also uh, pursuing now is I'm actually going to take um, two different products and enhance them with copper and start making awesome. those available later this later this year. So that's amazing. You don't work out for that, yeah. Yeah, and you there'll definitely. Be vegan, there'll be one for vegan and one for paleo. <laughs> that's awesome. Right on. Yeah. Yeah, the adrenal cocktail is really awesome. That that product from Jigsaw and it's easy for people. They don't need to 
do the recipe and find coconut water and right. they just want to start right. they can jump on that and exactly. um yeah, because we did have a question about, you know, you probably have to run, but is there anything that helps absorption of magnesium? But there's sodium and potassium kind of in there, right, that work with it a little bit right. or, is it, is, or well, holding on to it. Okay. So when people are having trouble absorbing magnesium, um, it very, might be, very often will be that their adrenals are challenged and stressed out. And so really good to do the adrenal cocktails to nourish the adrenals. So that the mineral ratio that runs the adrenals is a ratio of, of sodium to magnesium. And if you've got, if you don't have enough sodium because you're stressed out and you've been under a lot of stress, um, and you start pouring in a lot of magnesium, you're going to affect the adrenal ratio, which is going to weaken them even more. And so then what you've got to do is ease back on the magnesium, support the adrenals, with you, you want to have fat in your diet, you want to have vitamin C in your diet, you want to have minerals in your diet, and then the most important nutrient is called vitamin Z, which stands for sleep, and your adrenals really won't come back until you start getting seven, eight, maybe nine hours of sleep. And I know that's really hard sometimes, but that they are very sensitive to sleep deprivation. Mm. And so you have to be really... Um, you have to honor their need for for the rest. They need to go. They need to go horizontal in order to re repair and rebuild themselves. That's amazing. Yeah, it, I've been diving back into like dirty electricity, and I started mm -hmm. grounding again with the rod to yeah. earth connection out my window, and sure. just being on top of that stuff. My sleep has already improved the last couple of weeks, oh, wow. so it's awesome. I'm sure. And you're you're in the middle of nowhere, USA. <laughs> And so you're not you're probably not dealing with the same kind of EMFs mm. that people are that, that might be in LA or right. uh, in, in the larger metropolitan areas, but still you're not escaping it completely. But but what you're doing is really effective for helping to uh, calm the system down. That's very very important. Yep. Yeah, I like how you emphasize iron turns you into an antenna for EMF. <laughs> it really does. No, it's it's yeah. it's in the literature, folks. It's there. If you want to dig for it. So it's just, it's just you got to be more curious, and we spell that C U hyphen R I O U S. So you see, oh copper, oh yeah, I want to be, oh I am curious, so, <laughs> and and you're, there should be a lot of, there should be, you need to really be focusing on the copper side of your diet. It would make a big difference. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, uh, as always, thanks Morley. I'm sure we'll we'll do it again soon, and uh, Look forward I'll to put it. the. Awesome. I'll put the links below to everything and uh, stick around as I close out the show. Thanks so much. You bet. Well, I hope you were taking notes for that one. I know I was. Felt like being back in college. As with all conversations with Morley, I'm going to have to go back and listen to this one multiple times. I like that we started off with that Ray Pete quote. Sunlight is what keeps copper from becoming iron and all of the different causes of that. Too much estrogen, too much darkness, too much nitric oxide, or too little thyroid hormone. It's fascinating that nitric oxide is the backup plan if there's no copper. That completely makes sense, and that makes me think differently now about EMF mitigation. Because living out in the country now, I'm really sensitive when I go somewhere with a lot of EMFs, like a big city or an airport or just a population-dense area. I really feel it. And so copper is something that I'm going to emphasize more because I've been focusing on heavily on magnesium because of the calcium ion channel opening with harmful non-native electromagnetic fields. But it would make sense that copper is also critical because it allows us to make energy and to make a strong electromagnetic field from our cells, from our mitochondria, to actually push off these harmful signals that we are getting blasted with constantly. And it's my understanding that it's really that NO, that nitric oxide 
that makes EMFs that much more damaging because that will increase the amount of peroxy nitrite that super free radical that's created from EMF exposure. And I love that he made the distinction between copper driven and copper dependent. That might seem like splitting hairs, but there's a big difference there. And I never thought about that. And the information on ceruloplasmin, that active copper, was fascinating. In previous talks with him, he's made the analogy, do you want a bicycle? Do you want a jet? Do you want a car? Do you want a Ferrari? Do you want a motorcycle? He said ceruloplasmin can provide all of those things. And to me now, it makes sense when he talked about the four different forms, the soluble, the membrane, the hephaestin, and the zyclopin. Really interesting. And when you just think about the true epidemic of iron overload, the rust in your sink, in your bathtub, raised on cereals, raised on iron-fortified foods, and then you look at the health conditions that you're dealing with and you start to connect the dots, that's where it really makes sense. So if there were a lot of light bulb moments for you in this episode, I highly recommend you go back and listen to the previous six conversations I had with Morley because each one builds on each other and there's different information in each. And I believe this information is applicable to everyone. That's why I created the root cause protocol. And as Morley mentioned, the website's rcp123.org. A lot of great articles. If you go to news and research, tons of posts on iron toxicity, magnesium, hormone D, commonly known as vitamin D. And you could even find a practitioner. There's a RCP consultant directory where you can reach out to someone and do a full multi iron panel, see your iron status, get a hair tissue mineral analysis done and have someone analyze it. Because as I mentioned in the interview, the lab values have been skewed. And that is something that most people I would say have no clue about that when you go and you get a, a test like lab corp or these main blood tests, not only are they looking in the wrong place, they're the wrong lab values have to realize that. Who set the numbers? Who set the bar? So I believe this is just another layer of the onion of confusion of the matrix, the iron curtain, and it's by design. It's definitely by design to confuse people, especially in the alternative health community, because take a million supplements and this one's canceling this one out and this one's pushing you further out of balance. And it's like, okay, let's slow down. Let's look at the context of what you were raised eating. What were you drinking and bathing in your entire life for decades? And go from there and create a plan that makes sense. So there's a lot of protocols out there. I created one called the CLF protocol. And people often ask me about the RCP, if they should do it. And I would say absolutely yes. Check them out. Figure out your mineral balance. And it's definitely getting to the root when you start to work at the mineral level, especially with magnesium, copper, and iron. I'd say almost 100% of people have dysregulation of those three minerals going on. So my website is matt-blackburn.com, and I have my featured products up there on the front page, my favorite desiccated liver capsules, my favorite salt, I have a water filter, magnesium, my favorite methylene blue, blue blocking glasses. And with the magnesium, I've loosened up over the last few months on the different forms. I used to be strictly for bicarbonate or transdermal chloride. And I realized after looking at people's tests, taking various different forms, that all of the forms work. It just Depends on if you care about synthetic, which I don't. If it works, it works. And for a lot of people, synthetic magnesium does work. What do I mean by synthetic? Any form that is not bicarbonate or chloride or sulfate. 
those are the only three forms that we would ever come into contact with in nature. And now we have bisglycinate, we have malate, we have threonate, we have taurate. We have a lot of different forms. And are they bad because they're synthetic? No. If they can raise the magnesium levels, I would say do what works. I always recommend, though, making your own magnesium bicarbonate at home. You don't have to buy it because you're going to spend a lot more and you're just paying to ship liquid. You can go to Crucial 4. I have the link there to the salt and you can get to the website through that. And check out his mag bicarb. It's just magnesium hydroxide powder. And you mix that with cold carbonated water, like a soda maker. So you cool the water. I like overnight. You put it in the soda maker bottle. You add carbonation. I hit it five or six times from the CO2 tank that they include. You just add a little bit of the powder. You can't mess it up. It's not rocket science. All it takes is a pinch, though. You don't need to add much. And if you have leftover residue, it just means you added too much. And that's very likely. It's just a pinch that's required for that entire bottle. I'd say maybe a quarter of a teaspoon, something like that. And you take shots throughout the day and just go by bowel tolerance. You know, there were times where I would drink 32 ounces of magnesium bicarbonate concentrate that I made at home three days in a row. And then I would have loose stools for a few days. And okay, kind of went overboard. So it's all experimentation. You have to really play with dosages. Any supplement, I always tell people, MitoLife or otherwise, start slow. Because there could be a side effect to anything. Even the capsule, the base of the supplement, if it's MCT oil, whatever it is, if you have a reaction, it's going to be less intense if you take less, obviously. So just start slow when you're starting a new supplement. And I'm at the point now where I take six dissolve it all on an empty stomach first thing in the morning with a lot of water, a lot, I could say 12 to 16 ounces. And that's my systemic enzyme product. And then I'll take one vitamin E a day, about four vitamin K, MK7 form, K2. Anywhere from two to six niacinamide and five panacea tablets, which is a significant amount. I definitely want to start with one or two and two probiotics a day. My spore-based probiotic and endotoxin reducer. And that's pretty much it. And then some days I'll take more depending on the context, if I'm eating out, et cetera. And some days I'll take less. Sometimes your body just wants a break and it's good to listen to that. I added a few new products on my Matt Blackburn site. I have the infrared storage container. That's from Therisage. It's really cool. I use that if I'm roasting a lot of coffee at once or if you want to store your herbs. And it has a vacuum pump that you hand pump the oxygen out. And it's actually plastic infused with far infrared powder. And so it's... Definitely a unique design. It's not just Myron glass. It's not your normal container. It will actually preserve things for a significant amount of time. And with fresh roasted coffee, with coffee, I'm less about the mycotoxins and the mold thing, and I'm more about fresh roasted. I think that matters more. And there's different schools of thought on how soon to ingest it after roasting. Uh, Adam Bergstrom believes as soon as possible, and then I've heard up to a week. So I just have been doing somewhere in the middle and I just fill up the hopper on my Breville espresso machine. It was recommended to me by some friends. I was using the DeLonghi La Specialista for a while and it kept breaking down. And then I had tons of people message me saying theirs kept breaking down. They kept sending it in for repairs. So I ended up donating that to my local police office. So they're super happy. As long as someone's maintaining it every day, uh, it could work. But what I like about this Breville unit, uh, for anyone that's wondering, it's the BES 870XL model. It's about 700 bucks, but if you're ready to step up from the French press like I did for 
I don't know, four or five years, then this is definitely the next level. You can make espresso with it. You can make coffee with it. It has a milk frother and I haven't had any issues. And I'm going to make videos on the Mito Life Academy. I have been making videos on my coffee routine, but detailed specifics of how I do things because it's been a lot of trial and error and it's been a lot of people reaching out and saying, hey, instead of doing it that way, you should do it this way. It's better. And I said, okay, thanks. And I changed it up and like just hundreds of those little things add up to create a little routine. And call me a coffee snob or whatever, but I understand the benefits of coffee and the nutrients in the coffee with the caffeine and how it all works together especially with the Sheila G, maybe add some lion's mane in there if you want. I do it before every interview and it really gets me fired up in a balanced way because I have the maple syrup with it. I have my metabolism supporting it. I'm not mobilizing glycogen from my liver that's not there. The glycogen's there because I'm not on a starvation program. I'm not intermittent fasting. I'm not restricting. I'm fueling my body with food. That is when you add the coffee in and it works so much better. It doesn't suppress your thyroid. It doesn't suppress your metabolism. It actually supports both of those things. And another product from Therasage I threw up there is the Thera 03. It's only 135 bucks with my discount code. It's an ozone and negative ion generator. I mostly use the negative ion function, especially on drives. If the drive's over an hour, which for me, it always is. It just keeps me charged up, especially on the freeway when all the windows are closed and you're just getting recycled air or you're getting AC or heat. That really zaps the body electrically. And so just to set this on your dash or wherever where it's not going to roll around and set it to the negative ion function, it's made a huge difference in how I feel on drives. And with the ozone feature, I prefer to use that when I'm not in the sauna. So after I do a sauna session, I'll close it up and I'll run that and it just runs for an hour and then it turns off just to keep my sauna clean. And a MitoLife update, that is my supplement company at mitolife.co. The Purely K is finally back in stock. That was out for quite a while. That is the MK7 form of vitamin K called menaquinone 7, and it's been found to have numerous mitochondrial benefits. It's an electron carrier. It supports electron chain transport. It protects complex 5. It supplies complex 3 cofactors. And what's really fascinating is it actually upregulates AMPK signaling. It stands for activated protein kinase. And in the interview, Morley said that AMPK is the drumbeat of the body, that pathway. So that made me think of vitamin K. That is really fascinating. The more I learn about vitamin K2, the more I'm blown away that pretty much everyone is deficient in it because there are a lot of things that drain it, primarily secosteroid hormone D slash vitamin D supplementation, but a lot of other supplements. They'll tank your vitamin K2. I always recommend if you enjoy pasta, find a good hard aged cheese and shred that over your pasta and make that the star of the show of your pasta dish because cheese has got a bad rap, especially the last 10 years or so. And I've seen it. I used to be there. It's acidic, it's mucus forming, all the propaganda against cheese. It's such a superfood. Even just a snack on cheese straight, it's a complete meal. It's carbs, protein, saturated fat. I did that for years on long drives as I drove for a living. Just a block of raw goat cheese on the go. Maybe I'm biased because I have sand and goats, but I definitely felt the difference with it. So if you didn't know, I have a private YouTube school. It's called Mito Life Academy. I post four private videos a month. If you sign up for the third tier, which is the advanced tier, 
It's about 25 bucks a month. And even if you sign up for the basic tier, then you still get access to a few videos and one monthly Q&A where you can ask me questions and see what I'm up to, what's the latest thing. Every month it's different. The last few days I've been really fascinated with parasites once again and looking into different things, ivermectin, uh, anti-parasitic strategies, especially because I have animals and it's just something that happens and we're animals too. So it's just something that happens and having a strategy in place instead of just believing that they're symbiotes and they help us break down their food and there's nothing wrong with them or thinking they're the root cause of all of your ills. Usually the truth is somewhere in between. I found the last 11 years of studying health is found in that middle path and the balanced path. And that's no different with the parasite thing. It's not good to cover your eyes and say, I don't believe it. It's not real. It's not an issue. And then to go the opposite way, say it's the only issue. It's definitely good once a year or so, or if you've never done it in your life, to have some kind of a strategy for parasites. And I posted before the Shen Blossom Mountain Detox Tincture and the Aka Hinoki Tree Resin product. Just those two for 90 days, every day for three months. 100 days is the average egg laying cycle of your parasite. So that's how long you wanna stay on a substance that you're using for that purpose. You know, 10 days, two weeks is not going to do it. You actually have to stay on it. Depending on the protocol, there are definitely some nuke, nuclear bomb style protocols that I've done myself. And maybe I'll share those more advanced protocols on the MitoLife Academy. So thanks for listening. I'll see you on next Friday's show. Today's quote is from a 2016 article by Morley Robbins. Iron toxicity post number 38, why vitamin D and iron is not a good idea. Olson, J.A. Ross, AC 1996, article titled Vitamin A Deficiency. The opening paragraph said, anemia has long been recognized as a potential consequence of vitamin A deficiency. One of the known causes of iron anemia is lack of vitamin A. This means that those who are taking supplemental vitamin D are perpetuating their anemia status and not because of lack of iron. Mm-hmm.